Right. Uh, good morning. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, stresses, tectonics, and their links to cryovolcanism on uh, ice satellites. Um, and so I've, I've got a, a set of slides that I think are really good of uh, kind of giving an intuitive feel for what are these different types of uh, stresses that we're looking at and how they're driven and how we calculate them and then the patterns that they develop on the surface. Uh, but the main thing is um, we start with the, the equations as I, I lead you through these slides. Uh, these are the equations of the tidal stresses uh, in a thin shell um, uh, that are very simple and analytical. Uh, you, there are cases where the thin shell approximation probably isn't great, uh, and you could play the same game with a more complicated formula. Uh, but I just want to use this as kind of our, our backdrop uh, for showing you how uh, these different uh, tidal stresses manifest. And so uh, these stresses are on the surface of the, of the sphere. So here's a, a picture of our, our deformed planet with some primary. It's a distance A away. Um, the closer it is, the higher a tide will be uh, imparted onto its surface. And in the thin shell approximation, um, the height of the tide depends on the, the, gra the uh, average density of the body and how much it tidally responds, which is given by the H2 love number. And then the, uh, the rigidity of the outer layer that's being flexed. And so um, the closer it is, uh, the higher the tides will be uh, and more stress can be imparted. Um, and also the more rigid that outer membrane that's being or deformed is, uh, the higher the stresses can be. And of course, the H love number, how tidally responsive it is, the more tidally responsive it is, uh, the higher the stresses. Uh, but this form is the, the form of the equations. And, um, and so now I'm kind of going to jump through and show you how we use these equations to look at different stresses from different, um, different uh, processes. So the first one is just tidal reorientation. Uh, you probably have heard a lot about uh, non-synchronous rotation, and really that is the, the fact that the, the, the moon might be rotating faster than its, its synchronous rotation rate. And so that causes the tidal bulge to move uh, relative to some point on the surface and can also uh, cause stresses. And the way we calculate that with these tidal equations is by bookkeeping the location of the tidal bulge, which is in this uh, theta factor, which is the angle between the tidal bulge and the axis of symmetry of the, of the tidal pro problem. Um, the same equations can be used for polar wander. It's just a different axis of rotation than non-synchronous rotation. Um, and you can add these together if you have some sort of funky uh, rotation state. Um, but this is a proposed source of some of the long trending uh, fractures on, on Europa, for example. And so here's a visualization of that. There's a cartoon that just shows you there's this flag that's pointing at Jupiter where the tidal bulge is. And as it rotates non-synchronously, the flag uh, move. So that point relative to Jupiter has changed location. And that produces a stress pattern uh, like the one over here on the, on the left from uh, Greenberg et al. 1998, uh, where they show that some of these stresses seem to fit some of the patterns of the, of the large linear features on Europa. Um, you can also do orbital migration with these equations. So if you have a body that's moving closer or farther away from the primary, uh, that also changes the stress state. As you move farther away, the tidal bulge will uh, decrease in magnitude, and that change in shape will impress and, and, um, enhance uh, stresses on the surface. Or if you move closer to the primary, uh, the tidal bulge grows in magnitude, and that puts stresses on the surface. And so um, this is one of the stresses that we've, we thought about for uh, Triton and Phobos in our solar system. Uh, these are two moons that are falling into their, their host planets. Um, and it also might be interesting for extrasolar planets uh, that are moving closer to the stars. So here's this cartoon of work that we did with Phobos. Uh, here's a Phobos cartoon. That as it's orbiting Mars, it's getting closer and closer. And that getting closer causes it to elongate toward, toward Mars. And then the uh, stress pattern that you see on, on, the, on the left um, is the stresses that would be produced. And in, in this case, because uh, Phobos is moving closer, you get tension and kind of the sub-Martian and anti-Martian points on the surface. And then you get a mix of tension and compression uh, at latitude and longitudes in between those, those sub- and uh, anti-Mars regions. Um, you can play the same game for Triton. Uh, there's very few fractures to map, uh, but many of the fractures lie within the, the central tensile zone um, caused by the infall stresses. Um, here's a, a stress, 
stress mechanism that we don't talk about very much, but internal differentiation can also cause stresses on the surface. So internal differentiation really just changes the H2 response uh, of the planet, so how much it wants to respond tidally. And as you concentrate more and more mass in the center, you actually reduce the H2 love number. You reduce its ability to respond tidally to the, the, stress, the, the gravitational forces on it. And so uh, in this, um, it's very similar to the migration because you've got a, a bulge that's just collapsing. So uh, in our next, I don't have a movie for it, uh, but here's the stress pattern that you would produce because of a collapse of the tidal bulge due to differentiation. It's also the same pattern you would get if you were to move outward uh, in migration, but um, just physically it looks the same, but this is driven by a different mechanism. But anyways, as you collapse the tidal bulge uh, along the axis of symmetry, uh, you actually get compression in that direction, and then again in the inner region between the uh, anti-sub and anti-primary uh, regions, you get a mixture of compression and tension. And to my knowledge, I don't think anyone has tried to, to uh, fit any kind of stress pattern or any tectonic patterns to these, uh, these stresses, so you don't see any, anything dr drawn on that uh, figure on the left. Uh, and then finally, the, the stress that we talk about a lot, which is the diurnal stresses, um, it's actually a combination of the fact that as you're in an orbit that's not, well, mostly we look at the diurnal stresses from orbital eccentricity. And so orbital eccentricity has two effects. It causes the primary distance to change, so at pericenter you're a little bit closer to the primary, and at apocenter you're a little bit farther away, so that tidal bulge is going up and down throughout the orbit. But it also causes the location of the tidal bulge to change a little bit. So um, if you were to stand on, uh, say, Europa and look at Jupiter uh, at zero degrees longitude, Jupiter would hang in the sky above you right at, at pericenter. But then as you move in the orbit, Jupiter would seem to oscillate in the sky a little bit, and it rocks back and forth by about a degree or so. And so that change in the, in, in the location causes the change in the physical location of the tidal bulge. And the two together then uh, produce stresses on the surface. And there are other diurnal effects, or things I would lump into diurnal effects, like ob obliquity. Obliquity can cause the, the tidal bulge to uh, uh, migrate in latitude throughout the orbit, but it doesn't change the magnitude of the tidal bulge, just its place in latitude. Uh, and then there probably are longer non-diurnal uh, librations and such. You can have a libration at the, at the diurnal frequency or librations at longer frequencies, but we'll ignore those for now and just look at uh, diurnal stresses uh, from eccentricity. And so here's kind of a movie that just explains, or not a movie, a figure that just shows what I explained, um, that you know, at pericenter you're a little bit closer to your primary and you've got a larger tidal bulge, apocenter a little farther away. In this depiction it's harder to tell that the flag is actually moving in longitude a little bit, uh, but there is a rock back and forth. Uh, but this creates a really dynamic uh, stress field. So this is a, a movie, I think, of Europa. Um, but really any, anybody with orbital eccentricity would be very qualitatively similar. Uh, you get this pattern of um, tension and compression that seems to sweep across the, uh, the, the mid-latitude or the equatorial region. Um, and then in the uh, higher latitudes you get mixture of compression and tension. And in the uh, northern hemisphere they seem to rotate in a counterclockwise sense. And in the southern hemisphere they rotate in a clockwise sense. But again, the, the important thing is here, this is a very dynamic process. So on Europa, this whole cycle repeats every three and a half days. On Enceladus, it would be every 1.3 1, 1. days. Whatever the or orbital period is of the, of the satellite. Um, so in, in past, I've only talked about gravitational tidal stresses. Uh, but I thought for this, this uh, venue, I thought I'd play the same game with other sources of stress that can uh, be important uh, for these satellites and, and other bodies for, for tectonics. And so here's a, uh, the rotational stresses. I've taken uh, the equations from Hubbard, uh, his book, and just kind of um, rewritten them into some of the, the common uh, parameters that we use in the, in the gravitational case. The first thing to note is that the rotational stresses are of the same form as the gravitational stresses, in that there's still this degree two harmonic in them. The only difference is that the axis of symmetry here is uh, around the pole instead of the, uh, the equator primary uh, axes. So in here on these equations, the, the theta 
is from the axis of symmetry, so it's measured from the pole of rotation. Uh, but it's still, the important thing is that it's these stresses for the thin shell still really depend on the rigidity of the um, of the outer shell that's being flexed. But here, they also depend on the rotation rate. So uh, here in my cartoon, you can see that there's some ablation caused by the rotation, and that causes the equator to kind of expand uh, relative to the, the polar radius. Um, and then when we when we look at stresses from rotation from rotation, really we're just bookkeeping how the omega changes. So what is the rotate the, the rotation rate change, and then how does that then apply to a, a stress change? And I, if, if I'd followed my other slides, I would have circled the omega's red. So just like you know, that's where bookkeeping. The stress is. Um, fairly simple compared to the, or looks fairly simple compared to the, the tidal stresses. Uh, but in this case, I have a spin down stress. And so a spin down stress actually causes rebound in the polar regions. And so you can see in the polar regions here on the left, you've got tensile stresses as it's rebounding. And then there's a mixture of tension and compression in the mid latitudes uh, with tension uh, in the kind of the, along the longitudinal direction and compression uh, along the latitudinal direction. And if you were to spin up the body, you would get the exact you get the exact same pattern, but the opposite sense of all the stresses. And, and then finally, the final uh, stress I want to talk about is just um, the stress from radial change. So if um, you change the radius of the body and you want to expand or contract it, you're going to impart a stress on the surface. And, and this is the form of that stress in terms of uh, the rigidity of the body. It's a Poisson ratio. And then just the change in radius that you're, you're bookkeeping. Um, and I note that this stress can be rather large and can swamp out diurnal effects. And oftentimes, I think uh, when we have problems with uh, the magnitude of stresses trying to drive something that we're looking at on a body, uh, it's, it's sometimes um, people are tempted to think, oh, there might be some other stress, such as expansional or contractional stress, that can then get me over some sort of barrier to activate some sort of fracture. But uh, the main thing is that this stress is isotropic, and so it doesn't really have a directionality to it. And so the thought is that if you can combine this with some other stress mechanism, then it will take on the shape of the other mechanism and just give you a boost in stress. Um, in practice, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that, and so I haven't seen anybody actually do it successfully in a paper. But I've heard a lot of people give lip service to it at talks. But I'll just point out, for completeness, this is what the stress looks like. So in the next part of my talk, I want to talk about the responses to these stresses. We've kind of gotten a, hopefully, I can give you as, as quick of a primer on my intuitive feel for what these stresses are doing on the surface. But it's, like this, it's nice to see some actual uh, um, examples of these stresses at work in the solar system. And so these stresses, uh, we think they can fracture the bodies. Um, it, we think that they, they can. Things seem to fit best in the outer solar system when you look at um, fracturing uh, due to tension. And we've linked a num number of different processes to these stresses. And so I'll go through some of those. Um, the first is strike slip. So the first um, mention of, of strike slip from Tufts 1999 is it's looking at this long fault Astapalaya linea on Europa's uh, southern hemisphere. Uh, it's about the size of the San Andreas fault. And it, it shows a lot of offset with these parallelogram pull apart zones. And so Randy was able to reconstruct it and convincingly show that there's enough things cr that it crosses that you can realign when you reconstruct the uh, feature that it probably is a strike slip fault. And then he and uh, Greg Hoppe worked on this idea of tidal walking. So how do you get the strike slip? What kind of plate motions are going on on, on Europa? And they came up with the fact that this diurnal stress that we talked about is very uh, dynamic. And it could probably maybe lead to these offsets. And so the idea of walking, I think there was a talk yesterday that had a very good um, sequence of examples of it. But basically, you pull the, the fracture apart in tension, you shear it, and then when the fracture wants to go back in, or then you put it back in together in compression. But then once it's compressed, the opposite shear tries to relieve the offset that you imparted on the fracture. But because it's in compression, it can't quite do that. And so you're left with a little bit of offset. If you repeat this over every three and a half days for a long period of time, you can then build up a large amount of offset along these faults. Um, and then uh, Alyssa uh, took this process and kind of looked for the pattern. So 
so Greg and, and, and Randy were focused on just one fault on Europa, uh, and they seem to have the story of this tidal walking. Alyssa took it farther, and you know, there's a lot of strikes at faults on Europa, and if you do a survey of all of them, uh, you can see what kind of left or right lateral you have at different locations. And of course, with the tidal walking story, what determines the strike sense that you have depends on where the fault is located and its orientation uh, to give you whether or not it's going to be a left or right lateral fault. And so then she compared that to uh, models of this walking process and included obliquity into those models and found that there was a nice match between the pattern that we see on Europa and the, uh, the, the, the theory. And so this is kind of evidence uh, for there, there being a small amount of obliquity on Europa, uh, even though we haven't really measured it yet. Um, and then finally, the, the, I think the, the feature really put the, the nail in the coffin of the, the, uh, the ability of these dynamical stresses to do something are the cycloid features. So here are a bunch of pictures of cycloids on, on Europa. Uh, there are features that are, are defined by the fact that there are a bunch of arcuate segments kind of chained together. And we think that this has been interpreted as tensile fractures that are forming and then propagating in this dynamic stress field. And so as they're forming, they're actually being affected by the changes in the stresses, which causes the arcuate shape. And so here's the, the model uh, that they put together, where you have tension that breaks a fracture, and then it starts to propagate, but the stresses change orientations, and that causes the arc to the veer uh, and make that arcuate shape until the stresses get too low, the propagation stops until the next day. And you can form chains of uh, arcuate segments that way. Um, I will point out that some of the cycloidal features on Enceladus seem to have this kind of chain of arcuate shape to them. So here's this, uh, an example that I have put together for an LPSC abstract. Um, and then uh, some work that I've done, and I think Alyssa and, I, and um, Alex Padoff are doing probably better, is just to look at the orientations of the tiger stripes in general on Enceladus and see if they're consistent with formation in uh, by diurnal stresses. So here I've, look, I've plotted, uh, here at each of these bubbles, uh, in the inner region is a gray re area, and that's the area that's allowed orientations uh, if you allow fracturing to happen between 20 and 90 kilopascals, which seems to be what we use on Europa to match fractures fairly well. Uh, in models of stresses on Enceladus, we don't really know what the tidal response is, but I've modeled them to give us some stresses that are on the order of the same stresses that we see on, on Europa. Uh, so we reach these stress thresholds. And then again, that gray area is the uh, orientations that's allowed. And then the blue lines are the lines of the actual orientations of the fracture around that location. So you can see there's quite a well, pretty good agreement between the, the blue and the gray, which uh, I think is indications that it's consistent with the formation uh, from tidal, tidal diurnal stresses. Um, but once you have these fractures, you know, really, can they be exploited as conduits for eruptions? And really, we have Enceladus as the archetypal example of this. So here's the uh, discovery photos from uh, Porco et al. And, uh, and the, the serious hot spots kind of give us a clue to where these things are coming from in the uh, tiger stripe features. Um, I have a movie here of just how the stresses work on these uh, fractures in the South Pole. Uh, here I've just projected the stresses to the South Pole. Uh, I'm going to color the fractures green if they experience tension, and they're black if they're in compression. And then the clock on the right just shows you kind of where in the orbit you are. Uh, oh, I didn't want to play. And there we go. But again, this process happens every 3.7 3 days, um, and you go from compressive stresses at, at Perry Center to basically tensile stresses at Apple Center and back again. But the, the fact that you're changing the stress state on these fractures kind of led us to, to think that you might be able to change the output of the, uh, the eruptions uh, from Enceladus. And indeed, um, uh, we did observe that in the VIMS data and also in ISS data later on. Uh, that you can see that there is a, a change in the brightness of the plume. Uh, and here I've scaled the ISS and the, and the, uh, the VIMS data uh, by a common data point to basically show you what the cycle looks like. But 
The main thing is that uh, if you just use a simple model of tidal stresses and say, hey, if things are in tension, we have eruptions, this is what you would predict. <laughs> you would predict the activity really early on in the orbit and then falling off uh, toward the end. And it's not really, it doesn't really work really well. And then Francis uh, shifted that, said, hey, what if there's some sort of lag? You have a, a thicker ice shell, you lag the system, you can get a, a fairly, fairly decent fit. Uh, but you know, it, it predicts this plateau of activity, which you don't observe in the data. And so some work that I'm doing now is to kind of start thinking about reservoir depths and, and hitting those. So this, this red line is just at the stresses at the surface. Um, and you can imagine, if you hit, even if you have something in tension, if you're right at the surface, just a little bit below you, the overburden stresses could, could put you back in compression. So it's probably not the best representation of the system. So I've tried a bunch of different um, depths, and here's the, the fit that works the best, uh, I think. And so here's a source at about 750 meters, which you can still tap in tension. So the red line is just the, fra the percentage of the, uh, the scale percentage of the uh, fractures in tension. Uh, throughout the orbit, and it seems to fit the pattern pretty well. Uh, but you still do need a, a little bit of lag in the system. But I think the main thing I want to show you, point this out here, is that you really have to start thinking about where the magma, or whatever is erupting, where it is in the system. We can't just think about uh, what's going on on the surface of the, of the planet. And again, uh, here I plotted um, the maximum depth of Coulomb failure. So if you think of these fractures as just vertical conduit straight into the surface, you can crack down intention to some depth, and then you can have activity even lower than that depth through Coulomb failure. So even though the, the fracture is in, in compression, if the shear stresses are high enough, you can overcome that compression and still have fracturing. And so uh, that allows for the, the, the assumptions I made about Enceladus to have kind of activity down to about three kilometers. And a lot of the places on the, the tiger stripes where you see activity seem to correspond to where you have these um, deeper uh, depths that you can go to uh, through Coulomb failure. Um, but that brings us to an important question. If, it, if it's important to think about what is the depth of the magma chamber, what does that mean for different bodies? We've been talking about Enceladus. Uh, but if you have stresses on the order of 100 kilopascals, which is kind of the diurnal stress uh, level, we think, on Europa, maybe on Enceladus, then on Europa, that means that you're going to only have fracturing and activity not even down to 100 meters from those stresses. Uh, I put down Triton. It's a little bit better <laughs> at around 100 meters, maybe a little bit larger. But also, bear in mind for, tr for Triton that there's no orbital eccentricity. So uh, only orbital obliquity or some sort of lib librations might give you some sort of stress in these ranges. And then for Enceladus, you can get down you know, to a kilometer or so. And if you have some larger stresses, uh, then you can get deeper, of course. And so I put down one megapascals because this is about the stress that we think non-synchronous rotation can import to the surface. Or if you were to have some sort of global expansion or contraction, you can get stresses of these magnitudes. Um, but I really want to point out that you know Enceladus is kind of special in that it's small. And because it's small, it allows these, these fractures to propagate lower you know, into the surface, or deeper into the surface because the gravity is smaller, and so the overburden stresses are smaller. And also, if you have water that's closer to the surface, then it's easier to tap them on these small bodies. So I think uh, Enceladus might be a special case that allows us to see the activity uh, fairly easily. Um, oh, and I'll just point out, in, in work that I've been doing, um, there is a buoyancy problem with water, but I think we can, the back of the envelope first assumption might be that you can get water up to within 90% of the, the surface. Just That's kind of a float line of an ice uh, on top of an ocean. And so the thicker the ice shell is, uh, kind of the deeper that 90% line is. And as you get thinner, uh, you can start to get closer and closer to the surface. So on Enceladus, we first thought, you know, maybe the ice shell is 20 kilometers thick. And so then you'd have to get water up. That means water could get up to about two kilometers of the surface uh, somehow. And then the stresses could actually tap down to that, that depth. You can, stress, you can go to tensile stresses to about a kilometer. You can probably go deeper with coolant failure. Uh, but you know, more and more recently, it seems that Enceladus's ice is thinning in all the models that people are using. And so that actually helps us. Uh, a 10 kilometer ice shell would only have, would be able to get water up to about a kilometer, within a kilometer of the surface. And then we can actually fracture down intention to that depth. 
So Enceladus, again, a thin shell, and the fact that it's small makes it a little bit easier to get water to. And so I think I'll skip my summary. I just put this movie up. This is a movie I did for Enceladus where I just assume that there's some sort of water reservoir, water table at about three kilometers depth, and then showed uh, what the stresses are like. And here, the stresses are yellow if it's breaking and coolant failure, and red if it's in tensile failure. And you can see throughout the orbit, these stresses grow and allows these, these acti this activity or these stresses allow the fracture to plumb to the greater and greater depths until at some point you can hit that three kilometer mark and then I just change the color of the plume to maybe indicate some different material coming out. These, these plumes are very active, but I think it's very possible that the composition of the plumes could be changing daily too as you uh, activate different uh, depths underneath it. So I'll leave that up and take any questions if I have time. Hi. Um, so when we're looking at volcanology, uh, dike propagation doesn't happen independently of the existing stress field. It's, it's very, very strongly affected by it. But it's also strongly affected by the state of the magma reservoir, which for IC satellites, according to the, the work that I've seen over recent years, it looks like the ocean may well be quite highly pressurized. Um, have you given any thought to the interplay of that ocean pressurization with these tidal stresses and, and how fracture propagation could possibly go deeper, in effect, if you've got massive additional stresses because of compression? Yes, I haven't. I, I, I'm aware that, that the uh, ocean can be pressurized in some of these systems, and I'm not sure which bodies are better or worse for, for looking at that. Um, I think. If you have a pressurized ocean, then you can get yourself water up probably above that float line a little bit easier. I have not really thought too much about what is the fractures down at lower, lower depths, whether they're basal fractures that are coming up or some other, other type of fractures. Just these are very brittle, icy systems, and maybe they're just fractured in, in, uh, intrinsically that allows water to come up to it. But I think pressurization does help you get that water up even higher uh, into the water column uh, or into the ice column. And um, I've kind of been staying very conservatively at that 90% line. Uh, there's just, well, and on Enceladus, I don't think we need to, we don't need to invoke any other thing. I think when you start thinking about Triton or, or Europa, if we do have plumes, then it's either very near, sur it's got to be very near surface water if you're going to be tapping them with tidal, tidal like stresses. And so then you do need some other mechanism to help you get that water up there. So I, to follow up on that, I, I'm too curious about the, the role that these overpressurized oceans uh, play in, in the eruption factor. Uh, you know, I, I'm skeptical, even in the sort of thin ice models, how long you can sustain a fracture at the base of these ice shells just because of how ductile that ice is. Um, for, for long periods of time, I think it's going to be challenging, especially because it's if you relieve it, you're going to change, maybe change the, the, the density of the ice and then it will refreeze. Um, but I was curious about the, the, the differentiation stress that you talked about. I, I hadn't heard you talked about that before, and that's really neat. But that's like a, uh, a stress that's really going to happen early in the, the ice shell history or the planet, the body's history, right? So, the, um, so even if you assume that the stress won't relax away, we might not see any evidence of that, right? Right, yeah, there are different time scales for these processes. So I, I would agree with you. If, if there was a signature of differentiation, it would be very early on. But um, wouldn't something like the solidification be like differentiation as, a say, an internal ocean gradually freezes? That would be the expansion. So you'd have that expansive stress everywhere. Yeah, but still isotropic. Yep, isotropic, yeah. whereas differentiation has a pattern to it. But there are some bodies still experiencing different, uh, maybe, I mean, maybe um, Callisto is still, it's part, it's undifferent, or it's partially differentiated. It yeah. could still be going on, who yeah. knows. Yeah. We don't see any fractures regardless on the surface, <laughs> but it's, it's yeah. a possibility. Okay, another question back there, Bill? Yeah, Terry, Terry very, very, very nice. I, I agree with you that uh, for Enceladus, given you continually uh, take the cork off, I think long-term pressurization is probably not actually playing a role there. But it's very encouraging, just like you said, to get these tensile stresses down uh, even for you know, one bar of tension because the, 
it's not just that the overall shell thickness has dropped, but also especially the shell thickness in the south polar terrain, which is right. really what we're talking about. But that brings me to my question. So you can't, at this point, you can't actually predict what the phase lag is. It's just sort of an arbitrary fitting factor. And but let me finish the question. The real question is, what about Europa, where they tried to predict where they would see the plume the next time, and they would use Hubble to look again, and then they didn't see it, but maybe they don't have the right phase lag, or the right position. I mean, have you thought about how you would take that your Enceladus intuition and apply it more specifically or more more precisely to Europa? Right. Um, so with the phase lag, in the thin shell models, I can just put in arbitrary lag. That's all I can do. But you can use a thicker shell model that when you put in the right material parameters, that falls out. Okay. What is that lag? So you can do it more robustly and get that same answer, I think. Uh, for Europa, I think Alyssa has done a really great job of looking at those um, the uh, observation sequences and seeing whether or not they really what well, what the conditions were at each time to see whether or not they were the same or not the same. And um, my problem is that oftentimes when you have those uh, detections, there's some case that is very similar in terms of orbital position and everything where there wasn't a detection. Yeah. And so it kind of, right now, is kind of pointing at non-periodic eruptions that exist. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Ah, uh, yes, Jeff. I'm just wondering if, if work has been done on the phase lag to look at um, the lag in time between when you would at, when particles and gases would leave the surface and when you would actually observe the brightening uh, high up above that in the plume. Uh, I'm pretty sh sure that Nimmo has argued that that's a very short lag, and okay. even the lag of material coming up through the conduit is fairly small too. So that's an I have thought about it, and it's like you know within a degree or two, and okay, uh, orbital position, which isn't a lot of time. Actually, less than a degree or two, less than a degree of orbital position. I've, I've looked at it, and I've, I've convinced myself too that it's not probably likely 